Okay, welcome back. This is part two of the practice paper, uh, non-calculate paper. So here we've got to do a little bit of substitution. So x is 8 and y is minus 3. So I'm just going to write the numbers in. So it's 2 lots of x, so it's 2 times 8 plus 3 times minus 3. Okay. I'm going to work out the brackets first. So 2 times 8 is 16 plus minus 9 and I've got 4 lots of that. 16 plus minus 9 well, 6 really saying 16 take 9 so if I take 6 away that would be 10 and another 3 that would be 7 so it's really saying I've got 4 lots of 7 Okay, 4 times 7 is 28. Okay, next one, factorising, that's putting things into brackets. So I need to look at the coefficients of the letters. We haven't got any squared or higher powers of letters. So I'm looking for the highest common factor of 15, 35, and 40. They all end in a 5 or a 0, so 5 must go in. Okay, so I'm going to take 5 as being my highest common factor. What do I times 5 by to get 15x? Well, that must be 3x. Times it by 7y to get 35y. And I would times it by minus 8z to get minus 40z. So I factorise that. Just check, do 3, 7 and 8 share any common factors? Well, I've got two primes there, so they can't. Okay, so question 18. Write down the probability of scoring a 4 with one spin. Okay, so we've got one 4 out of five options, so that's a fifth. Okay, could express it as a decimal if I wanted, or even as a percentage. Never put it as a ratio. Next one, work out the probability of scoring a total of 4 with two spins. Okay, so this is a sample space diagram it's wanting. So spin 1, I've got those as my possible outcomes. Spin 2, I've got those as my possible outcomes. Okay, so I'm going to make a little table. Right, uh, so there's my table. And each of these blank spaces, I'm going to add the numbers together, each of these blank spaces in an outcome. So I've got a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 by 5 grid. So my total number of outcomes is 25, because 5 times 5 is 25. Um, possible ways of scoring 4. Well, I could fill the entire table in um, and circle them out. So that would be 2, 3, uh, 2, uh, that's 3 again, that's 4, that's 5, okay, that would be 3, well this would just repeat that row down there, okay, 2 and 2 make 4, 2 and 2 make 4, 2 and 2 make 4, 3 and 2 make 5, 3 and 2 make 5, make 5, so all these other ones are going to be bigger than uh, 4, so I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 ways just circle them, one, two, three, four, five ways of scoring four. So my answer there is five out of, hold on, there's a mistake, look. There's another way, because two and two actually make four. So it's not five, it's six out of 25, okay. So my answer, nice and clearly, 6 out of 25. Okay, question 19. Sam drives from Newcastle to Hull, then Hull to Bristol. Tim drives from Newcastle to Liverpool, and then from Liverpool to Bristol. Sam drives 10 more miles than Tim, work out the distance by road from Liverpool to Bristol. So we're wanting to know how far it is from Liverpool to Bristol, which is that length there. Okay, well let's call that length X. Sam, he drives from Newcastle 
to hull and then from hull to Bristol. Okay, so we've got two lengths there so we can work out how far he, find, how far he drives. Tim drives from Newcastle to Liverpool and we know that's 175 miles and then he drives from Liverpool to Bristol. Okay, Sam drives 10 more miles than Tim. So this 130 miles is completely irrelevant to the question. Work out the distance by road from Liverpool to Bristol. So I'm going to have to work out how far uh, Sam drives. Okay, so I can work out Sam's journey. So Sam goes 145 plus 220. So that's 365 miles for Sam. Sam drives 10 more miles than Tim. Okay, so 10 more miles than Tim. Uh, so Sam drives 10 more, so Tim drives the 365, but minus 10, which equals 355. So I've got three marks I'm showing, some bits of working here. Um, work out the distance by road from Liverpool to Bristol. So we know that Tim must drive 355 miles. So I'm going to do the 355 miles and I'm going to take away the distance which is 175. Okay, 5 take 5 is 0. And that across. Okay, 15 take 7 um, is 8. 2 take 1 is 1. So the answer is 180 miles driven in total. Okay, over the page. Let's get both bits out here. I think it refers to that diagram. So Rob is going to drive 130 miles from Hull to Liverpool. There are roadworks for 25 miles of the journey. He assumes an average speed will be 50 miles an hour where there are roadworks. 70 miles an hour for the rest of the journey. Use his assumptions to work out his journey time. Okay, so 25 miles of roadworks over 135 journey. So 130 miles take away the 25 means 105 miles at 70 miles an hour and 25 miles will be at 50 miles an hour and 70, sorry, 105 miles will be at 70 miles an hour. Okay, so I've put two assumptions down there, I've got four marks to go for, so I've worked out one bit, so I know I've got one mark even if I can't do the rest of the question. So we're working out time, so we know that speed is equal to distance over time. Okay, so rearranging the formula a little bit, speed times time would equal distance, so time must equal distance divided by speed. Okay, so I'm going to work out his time for these bits. So he goes 105, so the time on the motorway will be 105 miles divided by 70. Okay, so 70 goes in at least once, leaving 35 over. So I might just do a little bit there 35 divided by 70 is 1.5 so that's 1.5 hours now it's important to know that one and a half hours okay that'd be 30 minutes his other part of it it goes a distance of 25 miles at a speed of 50 25 divided by 50 is a half or 0 0.5 okay hours Try not to get outside the margin. So his total time would be 1.5 plus 0.5, which equals 2 
hours, so my answer is two hours. Okay. Part C. Rob's assumptions about his average speeds are too high. How does this affect his journey time? Okay. Well, if his assumptions are too high for his journey time, it means that he's going too fast. Okay. If you're going too fast, okay, that will actually make your journey quicker when you're going faster. So if his assumptions are too high, his journey will be slower. Okay, so we just want to put his journey will take longer, or we could say would be slower, something to those effects. Okay, that basically it'll be more time. Right, this Venn diagram question is really interesting. A lot of people struggled with this, okay? So the first part was fairly simple. What does uh, the number seven represent? Well, it means that they are studying both history and geography, okay? So we can just put here this study or studied both subjects. Okay. 20 students study geography. Let's see better English now. We can put students studied both subjects. That should be a small s, but there we go. 20 students study geography but not history. 19 students study history. So this section. Everybody in this area here, I've just drawn around, would study just geography but not history. So that's the 20 in there, okay? In total, there would be 27 students that study geography because that's the whole circle. This is the bit where people went wrong quite often. 19 students study history. Well, we've already got 7 there. So 19 takes 7, okay? 19 takes 7 means I've got 12 remaining. So that 12 must go there. Okay? The bit here is for students that don't study anything. Okay? So we've got to work out how many students that is in total. So if I do 20 plus 12 plus 7, okay? That's 9, gives me 39 students. 50 take away 39 is 11. So I must have 11 students who didn't study anything. Okay. Ratio question. Again, we've been doing lots of this at the minute, so hopefully everyone's uh, done pretty well on this. Uh, here are the instructions from a bottle of fruit squash. How much fruit is needed to make 150 millilitres of fizzy juice? Okay, so to make fizzy juice at the minute, it's two to seven, okay? So that will make nine parts. So all we need to do, two to seven makes nine. We want 450, okay? So sometimes it's gonna be easier to spot that multiplier. 450 divided by nine, well 45 divided by nine would be five. So that must be 50. So we're gonna times by 50, okay? It's only asking me how much fruit squash is needed. So this part is the squash, this part is the lemonade. So I only really have to worry about times in that by 50. 2 times 50 is 100. So my answer is 100 millilitres of fizzy, sorry, of fruit squash. Right, part two then. Same ratio, Tom's got 80 ml of fruit squash, 210 ml of lemonade. What's the maximum amount of fizzy juice he can make? Lots of ways of solving this problem, but I think it's quite nice if we just set out the ratio again, because the ratio doesn't change. It's two to seven, okay? He says he's got, that's his squash, that's his lemonade. He's got 80 ml of that and 210 ml of that. Now what we're just gonna look for are the multipliers. What can we get through here, okay? What have we been times in by? So 2 times what gives me 80? Well, that's going to be times 40. And that one, seven, 210 divided by 7, well, that would be 3, so that must be times 30. So the most that you can make is 
30 times that ratio. Okay, so that's because he hasn't got enough to make times 40 basically of the lemonade. So if I do 2 to 7 and times both sides by 30, okay, 2 times 30 is 60, 7 times 30 is 210, 60 plus 210 gives me 270 millilitres of drink. So that's how much you can make, 270 ml. All right, okay, question 22. We're starting to get into the more juicy questions now. A um, little bit more maths involved. Four marker again, okay. Uh, four identical circles just fit inside the square as shown. So that's 12, so it must be 12 down this way as well because it's a square. Work out the area of the shaded section. Give your answer in terms of pi. So if I work out the area of the square, and then take away the area of the four circles, that should leave me with the shaded area. Okay? Well, if I don't know anything else, I can at least work out the area of the square is 12 times 12, which is 144. That will get me one mark. Okay, let's just put the units in there just to be sure. Okay? So, next bit's a little bit uh, more complicated. So, if all the way across is 12, halfway across, which is one circle, must be 6 which means the radius of one circle must be half of six, which is three. So the area of one circle, and this is where we need to remember the formula pi r squared, the area of one circle must be pi, so I'm just going to put the circle area, is pi times three squared, which is nine pi, oops, nine pi, like that. But I've got four of them, so four circles will be four times nine pi, okay, which is 36 pi. So the shaded area is the 144 centimetres minus 36 pi, okay. Now I can put that in as my answer. 144 minus 36 pi. It doesn't ask me to simplify it or factorise it, but if I was really being geeky, and sometimes I am, I know that 36 goes into 144 four times. So 36 is a factor. Okay, 4 times 36 is 144. So I could have that also as my answer. Okay. A probability question next. Okay. So bag A contains 10 blue and 20 red balls. Bag B contains 8 blue and 12 red balls. A ball is chosen at random from each bag. Joe says it's more likely that a blue ball is chosen from bag A than bag B because there are more blue balls in bag A. Is she correct? You must show you're working. Three marks. Okay, so at the minute um, we've got some probabilities, but here we've got 30 balls in total, and here we've only got 20 balls. So they're actually out of different amounts. Because they're out of different amounts, we can't uh, do anything with them. Okay, so is she correct? We must show our working. So here we're looking at being able to um, compare equivalent fractions. So we're talking about blue balls um, and which has got a higher proportion. So bag A, okay, the probability of blue is equal to 10 out of 30. Okay. Uh, bag B, the probability of blue, so the P of blue is equal to 8 out of 20. All right. So what I'm looking at doing is I can try and get them to either be a fraction that I can then turn to a decimal or I can get a common denominator. Um, I know that 30 and 20 both go into 60. So if I was going to put it out at 60, I could times that by 2, so I'd times that one by 2, so that would give me 20 out of 60. I was going to get this one to be out of 60, I'd times that by 3, 
Okay, so 3 times 8 is 24 out of 60. Okay, so which is more likely? Okay, so I can say bag B is more likely Joe is incorrect. I could also say if I wanted that this was equal to one third, okay, and one third we know is 0 0.3 recurring. This uh, is equal to two fifths, okay. 2 fifths is 0 0.4, okay, so compare the decimals, 0 0.4 is bigger than 0 0.3, therefore bag B is more likely. So you can do it either way, we can do it with the common denominator way, or we could do converting to uh, a decimal way, just depending on how good your fractions to decimals are. Right, 24, standard form question, okay, which of these has the greatest value? Okay, so a few different ways of doing this. Um, not all these numbers are in standard form at the minute. So the ones that aren't in standard form are that one. And uh, I will stop and ask the class, why is that number not in standard form? And that number there. Okay, hopefully one of you have just realised why that number is not in standard form. And it should be that we've got to have a number between 1 and 10. So let's write that in standard form. Let's write this one in standard form. So it'll be 6.1499 times 10 to the power of, and it's moved 1, 2, 3, 4 places. Okay. So moving it to that means, okay, the biggest one is going to be to have the biggest power. So it's between this number and this number. 6.14 6.16, so this one's bigger, so that is the bigger number. Right, uh, I bet this one caught a few of you out. Um, Jack works out the answer to the, this particular calculation. He says the answer is negative. Is he correct? You must show your working, so I've got to show something, okay? Well, this is an estimation type question. You're not on a non-calculator paper expected to know that. Okay, so let's just round um, to some sensible rounding. So it's roughly the square root of 100 minus 12 over minus 1. Okay, square root of 100 is 10. So 10 minus 12 divided by 1, which is roughly minus 2 over minus 1. A negative divided by a negative, that equals 2. So is he correct? we can say Jack is not correct. Okay, so we've shown with our workings there quite clearly that he's not, well let's maybe give a bit of a, a better reason. So what's the reason? Well this is the reason here, isn't it? And the reason is that we've got a negative divided by a negative equals a positive. Okay, so just making sure we've been there's two marks. Um, next one then, so a ball is dropped from a height of 50 metres after each bounce it reaches 20% of its previous height. Okay, how high does it reach after its second bounce? Okay, right. so this one, this question, I'd like to draw a little diagram. Okay, there's my 50 metres. Okay, after each bounce it reaches 20% of the previous height. So, after the first bounce it's going to be at 20%. So, first thing I want to do is I want to work out 20% of 50. Well, 10% is 5, so 20% must be 10. So, it must reach 10 metres. So, that means that my second bounce, okay, is 10 to 0 and it's going to reach 20% of 10. Okay, so 20% of 10, 10% is 1, 20% must be 2. So, how high does it reach after its second bounce? It reaches 2 meters. 
Ah, right. Correct equipment. Use a ruler and a pair of compasses in this question. Construct the perpendicular bisector of the line AB. There'll be a short break while I find my compass. Right, here I am. Fully tooled up. Got a few weapons of maths instruction. Okay, so perpendicular bisector. Key point. Point on B. I'm just going to draw an arc in. Keep it set at the same amount, don't move the setting. Point here on A. Okay, draw the arc in. Ooh, a little bit of a slip, but not to worry. Then the important part is it says to use a ruler, so I must be drawing a straight line somewhere. Those two points of intersection, draw it on nice and neat. Nice easy two marks. What can we do to check? Well, perpendicular means it cuts at 90 degrees, so it should cut that line at 90 degrees. We can check with our protractor, yes it does. And it should bisect that line, so that line is roughly 7 centimetres long, and it cuts it at 3.5, so it cuts it bang in the middle. Love the job. Right, oh, we're nearly, is that? Can't be, it's the last question. Okay, so this question, so the circle's got the diameter of 10 centimetres and the square has got the side length of 6, so that must be 6 there. Use Pythagoras' theorem, so we've got to use Pythagoras' theorem to show that the square will fit inside the circle without touching the edge of the circle. So what it's asking is, does that square go in there, something like that? So we're interested in that diagonal there, okay? That's a right angle. That's going to be the hypotenuse of the circle. Um, Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c squared is the hypotenuse. Okay, so I've basically I've got a triangle that looks something like that. So I've got 6 and 6, that's my a and b side, and that's my c. Okay, so 6 squared plus 6 squared equals c squared. Okay, so that's 36 plus 36 equals c squared. Two 36s are 72, so 72 equals c squared. So the root of 72 will equal c. Okay, root of 72 is equal c. Now I don't know that off the top of my head, however. I know that 10 squared equals 100, okay? So, therefore, root 72 must be smaller than root 100, or 10 squared. So C, the hypotenuse, will fit inside that circle, okay? So I can just put that in, the square will fit inside the circle. Okay, let's make that look a bit more like fit. There we go. So the square will fit inside the circle. There we go. Job done. 80 marks.